battlefields of the future will be more dangerous than ever. In the 21st century, there will be threats to our freedom and security like never before. But will we be ready? Battles will be fought on land and sea, but they will not be won without supremacy in the air. Enter the incredible world of 21st century combat. Air power is the dominant strategic force. It's air power that lets you influence events and respond to events quickly. It's air power that lets you fight a war without putting hundreds of thousands of people on the ground. To date, Air Force F-15s have won more than 150 dogfights against enemy fighters without a single loss. And the Navy F-18 Hornet is widely recognized as the world's best carrier-based fighter bomber. But in the future, neither the F-15 nor the F-18 will be able to survive against deadly enemy anti-aircraft missiles. Surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, are going to represent the biggest threat. Those very formidable systems developed in Russia or China will have to be taken out of action very quickly in any future conflict. The fighter of the future will need to be stealthy to slip past enemy radar. It must be able to take out anti-aircraft installations. And it must out-dogfight any enemy fighters that get in the way. That future fighter is already here. The F-22 Raptor. The air dominance fighter of the 21st century. Developed by Lockheed Martin, this advanced tactical fighter has been designed to be the first plane to cross enemy lines, clearing the way for all other forces. The F-22 is both an air-to-air -air fighter and an air-to-surface fighter, so it can drop precision weapons. That means it'll be able to go in early in a conflict, knock out all the air defenses that an enemy has, and also take out certain ground targets, and open the door for all the U.S. forces, whether they're ground vehicles or other aircraft, to come in and continue the fight. The development of the F-22 Raptor first began in 1985, when the Air Force requested proposals for an advanced tactical fighter jet to replace the F-15 air superiority fighter. Military planners feared that the F-15 would not be able to counter new air and ground threats on the horizon. The result was the creation of the F-22. The capability of the aircraft is a quantum leap above what exists right now, and it's going to take air power and revolutionize it into a, a whole new world. In the battles of the future, stealth will be critical for all new fighters to avoid being seen by enemy radar. Non-stealthy aircraft just will not survive in the uh, air battles of tomorrow. Stealth technology was created to counter advances in radar. Radar works by sending out radio waves and measuring the amount reflected back to determine the distance, speed, and course of an object. But stealth aircraft are designed with surfaces that deflect radio waves away, making them nearly invisible to radar. The world's first stealth production aircraft was the F-117 Nighthawk. The reason that airplane is faceted is a limitation of the computer technology at the time. It's easier to model a finite number of flat surfaces than it is a bunch of curved surfaces. And while the aircraft was a breakthrough at the time, the facets limited the plane aerodynamically. But now, thanks to more powerful computers, engineers can design aircraft that do not have to sacrifice aerodynamics for stealth. The FNA-22's aerodynamic slickness allows it to 
uh, have the lowest drag of almost any aircraft ever produced. The F-22's aerodynamic superiority, combined with its stealth and firepower, make it a far better adversary than any aircraft before it. The F-15, which the F-22 will replace, has been a very successful fighter, but it is not stealthy. The F-117, while stealthy, carries no air-to-air -air weapons and is not designed for air combat. It relies on stealth and mission planning to protect itself. But the F-22, on the other hand, is not only stealthy, but comes with a full complement of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons. The primary ar armament is in weapons bays underneath the airplane where we carry six medium-range radar-guided missiles. By carrying the weapons internally, it preserves the stealthy shape of the plane. For closer infighting, the F-22 has short-range missiles and guns. Behind these two doors right here is the side weapons bay. This is where we carry heat-seeking missile. For close-in armament, the Raptor is equipped with the M61A2 cannon. The muzzle is hidden right behind this door right here. It's hidden because of the uh, stealth characteristics of the airplane. Cannon carries 480 rounds and is capable of shooting 100 rounds a second. The F-22's advanced weapons systems will make it a formidable interceptor, as will its unique ability to find enemy aircraft without revealing its own position. When other planes use their radar, they become visible to every other radar system in the area. But that's not the case with the F-22. Perhaps the highest tech part of the airplane is the radar itself. Not only does the radar have to be stealthy, but it has to be able to transmit and receive its own radar signals. How the F-22 radar achieves that remarkable feat is classified. But what is known is that the F-22 can see enemy aircraft at a distance while remaining invisible to them. The first time that the bad guys will really know there's an F-22 in the area is when one of them blows up. Along with its advanced radar system, the F-22 is the first fighter to have super crews, the ability to travel faster than the speed of sound without using its afterburners. A jet's afterburners boost speed by pouring fuel directly into the hot blast of the engines, adding fiery extra thrust. But afterburners are also wasteful, consuming enormous amounts of fuel, dramatically affecting the range and duration of a plane's mission. But the F-22 doesn't have that problem. Without using afterburners, it can supercruise at an incredible one and a half times the speed of sound, over 1,000 miles per hour. This is all about our pilots being able to go fast, minimize the amount of time they are exposed to any threat, do the mission that we've sent them to do, turn around and come home safely. The F-22 is presently the only fighter in the world with supercruise. But it wouldn't be possible without a very unique set of engines. The goals for Pratt & Whitney were to provide a transformational engine that the Air Force needed, one that was stealthy, maintainable, and fast. The F-119 PW-100 was developed by Pratt & Whitney after years of research. It sets the new standard for jet engines. Along with its incredible supersonic ability, the F-119 incorporates thrust vectoring. Here we are at the rear end of an F-A-22 Raptor. First thing you'll notice are the nozzles for the F-119 engines. In flight, during a maneuvering dogfight, they actually move up and down and vector the thrust of the engine to provide maneuverability. It helps us turn inside any foe. Uh, maneuver at low or high speeds to outmaneuver another airplane or potentially an enemy weapon that's headed towards us. The F-22's stealth, supercruise, and vector thrusting are impressive breakthroughs, but its most outstanding feature may be its ability to nearly fly itself through advanced computerized controls. It relieves the pilot of all the duties gives the pilot total freedom to just look out engaged in the combat scenario. 
In addition to monitoring its own performance, the F-22 constantly gathers data on other aircraft in the combat area and presents the most important information to the pilot. We're going to have information passed to us from either unmanned vehicles or from offboard sensors so that we can integrate data and use that information for targeting. And it's the way that we are driving our forces in warfare. We are much more integrated with both other services and with other platforms, and the F-22 fits right into that concept. The F-22 Raptor's total package of avionics, stealth, supercruise, and thrust vectoring make it the most technologically advanced fighter today. I've never been in an airplane that accelerates as fast, that's as agile, the ability to turn very sharply, and uh, it just brings a great combination of the, the speed, the stealth, and the avionics to the fight that nobody else is going to be able to touch. But there will be future competitors, like the Russian Sukhoi 37, which features thrust vectoring and a radical forward swept wing design. And the fifth generation MiG, the 1.22, which some have nicknamed the F-22 ski. The Russians are still very active aircraft developers. They've got a variety of technologies that they're continuing to improve upon and that can be made available to our future enemies. And so that's why we have to stay on top of the technology that we are developing and make sure that it is able to take out anything that other countries develop. When you look at the adoption by China of the Su-27 and the fact that it'll probably be modernized and improved, uh, that brings up the need for more advanced fighter aircraft in the US. And that's one of the main reasons, I think, why the Air Force is so insistent on the need to have the F-22. In addition to Russia, other U.S. allies are producing advanced interceptors for export that are superior to the F-15, such as Sweden's JAS-39 Gripen. And France's new Rafael. Germany, Italy, and the U.K. have joined forces to create a Eurofighter, the Typhoon. If these planes fall into unfriendly hands, the U.S. Air Force will need the F-22 to maintain their advantage. We are always going to go into war wanting to have that air dominance, and the F-22 is going to be the big boy on the block that can help us to do that. In future combat, the F-22 is to be joined by another stealthy aircraft, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the ground attack bomber of the future. Designed for the U.S. Air Force, Navy, Marines, and Britain's Royal Navy, the question is, will it work for every user? The rules of war have changed. Brute force has given way to high tech, and conventional weapons of the past will no longer be effective. In future battles, the F-22 will be the first fighter to cross enemy lines, surgically removing air and ground targets. Next in, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the attack bomber of the future. It will assume the air-to-ground attack role for the U.S. military. The F-35 can carry heavy weapons externally for maximum effect, but when a smaller payload is carried internally, it is nearly as stealthy as the vaunted F-117 Nighthawk. It has a significant amount of stealth capability to allow it to be used early on in, the, in a campaign, and it has a significant amount of weapons carrying and payload capability to be used at the later stages of campaign. The threat to the airplanes may not be as significant and require less stealth. The development of the F-35 was driven by the armed forces' desire to save costs by creating a ground attack bomber that would meet the needs of the Air Force, Navy, Marines, and Britain's Royal Navy. Airplanes are becoming very expensive these days, and we had to do something to get the cost of these airplanes back down to a reasonable level. The F-35 is expected to cost about $40 million, one-third the cost of an F-22 Raptor. But could one basic airframe be designed to satisfy so many different military demands? Each armed service wanted a stealthy ground attack bomber. But the Marines also needed a plane with short takeoff and vertical landing capability. 
the U.S. Navy required a craft with larger wings, heavy-duty landing gear, and an arresting hook for carrier landings. And the wings would have to fold up to save deck space. The size and scope of the JSF program is pretty significant. Uh, the airplane is being designed to replace the F-16 and the A-10 for the Air Force, the AVAB for the Marine Corps, and the F-A-18 for the Navy. Unlike the twin-engine F-22 Raptor, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter was designed around a single engine to keep down not only costs, but weight. A lighter plane can carry more weapons. For the Joint Strike Fighter, one of the keys of its mission is the ability to handle a large amount of ordnance and bring it to an enemy site. That all works better with a single engine. Air Force version of the Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35A, made its first flight attempt on October 24, 2000. Tom Morgenfeld, who had been a test pilot for the F-22 Raptor, was at the controls. Well, a million things are going through your mind. Your eyes are everywhere, you're listening, you're, you're watching. Uh, your senses are tuned to an incredible level because you're, you're sensing and feeling the airplane for the very first time. It flies wonderfully. It's definitely a pilot's airplane. The Air Force testing went smoothly. Next, a Navy version was built with heavy-duty landing gear and wider wings for the slow speeds needed to land on carriers. Navy test pilots flew touch-and-goes, demonstrating the F-35's ability to land within the space of a carrier's flight deck. But the most difficult challenge still lay ahead for the F-35 program. The Marine Corps needed a version that could perform short takeoffs and vertical landings, Stovall for short. The Stovall capability is extremely important to the Marine Corps because the airplane can go just about anywhere that the rest of the forces can go. It's not limited to needing a large runway. It doesn't need a really big ship to operate off of. Engineers at Lockheed Martin, the designers of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, took a hard look at the AV-8B Harrier, the Stovall fighter that the new aircraft would have to improve upon. The Harrier is a great airplane if you look at the fact that it's, it's basically 1960s technology. It's achieving all those wondrous Stovall flight sort of maneuvers without the aid of a lot of computers. The Harrier's ability to take off Hover and land vertically is achieved by vectored thrust. The powerful force of its jet engine is directed downwards through four nozzles that can pivot 90 degrees. I was brought in because I am a Harrier pilot with almost 1,600 hours in that airplane. So all of the lessons learned I have from the Harrier airframe and operational experience I, I have, I was able to bring to the program and use those to help evaluate the X-35 Stovall version. For hovering, engineers gambled on a radical new system. They planned to supplement the vectored thrust method by harnessing the jet engine to a drive shaft that would power a fan to blast air downward. In 1991, we unveiled this shaft-driven lift fan system to the technical world. Some actually said, you got to be kidding me. Are you guys serious? The lift fan required doors to open behind the pilot on the top and bottom of the plane to draw in more air. The fan would blast air down midship, while the jet nozzle in back swiveled, blowing its powerful exhaust down to create a balanced lift force. The shaft-driven lift fan system uh, allows you to harness a lot more energy out of what the engine is producing. But harnessing a jet engine to a drive shaft proved to be extremely difficult. The mechanical energy we were dealing with in the shaft-driven lift fan system was very large. We had 28,000 horsepower being transmitted from the drive shaft uh, from the main engine to the lift fan. And that's similar to the uh, power going through a U.S. Naval destroyer. The lift fan's ability to blend large amounts of cool air with the hot jet exhaust provided another important benefit. One of the things we learned in JSF was to combine the jet exhaust 
to get a lower combined temperature than the Harrier. This allowed us to avoid some of the problems with concrete where the concrete would actually burst and explode under the high temperature and high jet exhaust from the Harrier. At the Lockheed Martin Test Facility in Palmdale, California, the revolutionary lift fan system was put to the ultimate test, in the air. If the lift fan failed during hover, the plane would crash. It made its uh, first flight in 2001, and it was complete success. And at that time, I didn't hear any more from the people who had been saying for years, this thing will never work. It worked. Now, all three versions of the F-35 for the Air Force, Navy, and Marines are being developed and further tested for mass production. The United States, Britain, and their allies are expected to order more than 4,000 Joint Strike fighters, which will replace most American-built fighter bombers in use today. The handling qualities and performance are stunning. It really is a pilot's airplane. It sort of makes you feel like a little boy. You want to take it home and tuck it under the pillow with you at night. It's... <laughs> just a pilot's airplane. In future air conflicts, the F-22s will be used to establish air dominance. Then waves of stealthy F-35 Joint Strike fighters will use their superior weapons carrying abilities to attack other major ground targets. The Joint Strike fighter is going to be the backbone airplane for hauling freight. It is going to be the muscle part of sustained forces. Commanders can also alter an F-35's mission in the air as situations change during the battle. There are a variety of ways for the F-35 to bring in information from external platforms, other airplanes flying around the battlefield, satellite-based assets, ground-based assets. All that information can be presented to the pilot in the cockpit and allow him to be more of a tactician and manage the tactics of the game that day instead of worrying about the nuances of flying the airplane. The pilot's job will be to supervise the process of identifying the target and then to give consent for weapons release. The Joint Strike Fighter will be able to carry a wide range of weapons to include the heavier weapons such as the 2,000 pound bunker busters and 2,000 pound uh, blast weapons. The Joint Strike Fighter's one-ton bunker busters and blast bombs will be guided to their targets with pinpoint precision by JDAM tail kits. The Joint Direct Attack Munition, or JDAM, is a kit that can be put on any bomb to give it the brains to know where to go and the movable tail fins to guide it there. JDAM is a guidance kit that came after Desert Storm this little round piece on the side there is an inertial navigation clock. Now this clock, instead of measuring seconds, measures feet. If you take the unit and you tell it where it is right now electronically, and then you move it back a foot, or you move it up a foot, it measures every centimeter and every distance. The bomb knows the coordinates of where the airplane is, and it also knows the coordinates of where the target is. And when the weapon is released from the airplane, it simply flies from one set of coordinates to the other and does its thing when it gets there. Because a JDAM is directed by GPS, or Global Positioning Satellites, it can hit targets regardless of visibility. The way we use it is by employing it against targets that we cannot normally see visually, whether it is due to weather, smoke, haze or just some sort of other thing that's obscuring the target.
As a JDAM falls, its inertial clock keeps track of its position and signals the tail to make course corrections, directing it to the target. The accuracy of new weapons like JDAMs will reduce collateral damage. It also makes the F-35 an even more formidable weapon system. The new weapons such as a JDAM really reduce the need for the number of sorties and that reduces our risk because we're not exposed to uh, enemy threats as often. The F-35's combination of advanced weapons, avionics and stealth will help it ensure its success over the battlefields of the future. U.S. military planners wondered if these same features could be utilized in a helicopter. They wanted a stealth helicopter. But could it be done? Over the last 50 years, helicopters have evolved from slow-moving multi-purpose support vehicles to fast-moving frontline attack ships. But in the high-tech wars of the future, speed alone is not enough. Information is the key. There's three elements that are critical to warfare. The ability for you to know more than the enemy, the ability to maneuver quickly uh, around an enemy and gather more information about them, and the ability to provide precision firepower at the enemy. In future conflicts, after the F-22 Raptors and the F-35 Joint Strike Fighters have cleared the way, surveillance and attack helicopters will support ground troops as they move in to secure the area. We like to be down low where the action is. And we like to be down low where the threat can't see us. But at such low altitudes, helicopters are vulnerable to a wide assortment of ground-to-air weapons. All the simple systems, the guns, unguided rockets, the surface-to-air missiles, it's got to deal with all of that, and it's got to deal all of it effectively. The Pentagon has responded with a two-pronged strategy to counter this threat. Inexpensive, expendable, unmanned helicopters and stealthy manned helicopters. Unmanned helicopters will be primarily used for surveillance and for gathering targeting information. Fire Scout, designed by Northrop Grumman, was specifically developed to take off and land on Navy ships. However, the key to creating a successful manned helicopter for future combat is to make it stealthy like the F-22. But the question is, can it be done? Achieving stealth in a helicopter is different from stealth in a fixed-wing aircraft. You're concerned about different signatures, radar reflectivity, infrared, noise, all things that will give away an aircraft's position. Those signatures, like heat, smoke, and sound, put helicopters and their pilots at serious risk over the battlefield. All the small shoulder-fired missiles, which are very effective against helicopters, are heat-seeking infrared systems. The challenge for engineers was to create a quiet helicopter with very few signatures and a small radar cross-section. And that's exactly what Sikorsky has done with the new RAH-66 Comanche. In the Comanche, with all the stealth capabilities, we can defeat the radar threat. We can defeat the guy with the shoulder-launched heat-seeking missile. And from the guy popping up in the tree, our agility defeats him. Our small size, our quiet acoustic signature defeats him. Often the first thing you hear from a helicopter is the sound of the wake from the main rotor hitting the wake from the tail rotor. In the Comanche, the fan tail is shrouded, so there is no interaction between the fan blade tips and the main rotor tips, and it's also canted slightly and those all contribute to reducing the acoustic signature. Engineers also experimented with the main rotor to find a quieter design. If you look at a Comanche, it's got a five-blade rotor, and what that does is it uh, cuts down the normal chop, chop, chop sound from a helicopter into a more discreet whir that kind of blends into the background. Reducing the heat signature of a helicopter is also essential to making it more survivable. When you look at a Comanche, uh, the first thing you ask yourself is, where's the exhaust? Where does all this hot air get out of the engine? 
the Comanche's exhaust actually escapes through the tail boom, where it is instantly dispersed by cool air from the rotor. That missile has to have something to home in on, and that's a heat signature. Comanche defeats that by the engine exhaust being mixed with ambient air and cooling it so that there's no longer a heat plume for that missile to home in on. To defeat radar, the Comanche utilized the stealth secrets first developed for the F-117 Nighthawk. There are no radar reflecting right angles on its outer fuselage, and all weapons are carried internally to help keep its stealthy shape. What's interesting about the helicopter is some of the things that achieve stealth actually make the helicopter better. Things like the retractable landing gear and the retractable weapons bays, that also makes it sleeker and faster. So once you've bought into the stealth part of it, you get other superior attributes. The main role of the Comanche is to give commanders an overview of the battlefield by providing up-to-the-minute information. Comanche is going to be basically their flying cavalryman. It's going to dart in and out, slash and cut, be a reconnaissance vehicle. As Comanche's two pilots gather data, their computer shares that data with other allied forces. When the Comanche finds the enemy, he's going to kind of direct like a quarterback to apply the firepower to defeat that enemy. Engineering advances have also made the Comanche one of the easiest and most forgiving helicopters to fly. One thing the Comanche brings that other previous generation helicopters can't bring to the table is the pilot can maneuver the Comanche in virtually any axis without fear of exceeding any limits. Although it will be used primarily for reconnaissance, the Comanche will also be armed for self-defense. The Comanche is capable of carrying a wide array of weapons all the way from guided missiles using a laser guidance system, uh, heat-seeking missiles, which would be more of an air-to-air -air weapon, or unguided rockets, and also the latest Hellfire is pretty much a fire and forget. In addition, Comanche's pilots can ask Allied aircraft to fire missiles their way, and can then take over and guide those missiles to their targets. If the Comanche is hit, its computer system can often fix itself by reassigning vital functions to undamaged computer cards. This is where the computer brain of the Comanche is. In support of its reconnaissance mission, Comanche can control as many as five unmanned aircraft. When the Comanche may be employed, it may have little vehicles that it launches out, so it has its own little eyes over the hill so it can see what's going on without putting itself at risk. In addition to launching its own unmanned air vehicles, Comanches may be aided on the battlefield by swarms of LOCAS, small intelligent missiles with their own computer brains. It's about 31 inches long, weighs a little over 100 pounds, carries a single warhead, has a laser radar. In other words, it has a scanning laser beam that generates pictures. The LOCAS also communicate with each other and cooperate in searches and attacks. You could have a swarm of LOCASs, each of which has its own eyes, each of which is thinking, but each of which is com communicating with each other send that imagery back to the operators who could either use these as surveillance probes or, in fact, as weapons themselves. Weapons like LOCAS reflect the trend toward electronically linking all Allied forces and weapons so that information can be shared and used by all. By networking aircraft over the battlefield, with surveillance platforms and other weapon systems, commanders can quickly change missions to take advantage of up-to-the-minute information. The key to the air battle of the future is not necessarily stealth, speed, or firepower. It's going to be information. Unmanned air vehicles, or UAVs, will provide a large part of that information while flying long-duration surveillance missions. So, will the Air Force of the future have no pilots?
Since the very first use of airplanes in war, military planners have looked for ways to make aircraft more effective and more lethal. Once so secret their very existence was denied by the government, unmanned air combat vehicles, or UCAVs, are now poised to take the preeminent role in 21st century air combat. UAVs are certainly going to change air power in the 21st century. You can see it starting to happen today, but what we're looking at now is just the beginning because there's going to be more of them and they're going to be better. Unmanned aerial vehicles allow the military to do more with less, to put more aircraft into the air than you otherwise would be able to because of the limited number of pilots that you might have or where it might be too risky. In the future, aircraft that have no pilots on board will carry out the most dangerous combat missions. Today, unmanned air vehicles, or UAVs, are already taking over the role of long-duration surveillance. UAVs don't have mothers. You lose a UAV in combat and nobody bats an eyelid. One of the earliest surveillance UAVs was the Predator. It was developed in the early 1990s. When you look at Predator, basically they start off as being long endurance systems that can really persist over the battlefield. In Afghanistan, Predators provided critical real-time intelligence. And it was there that a Predator made an amazing transformation from surveillance to armed aerial attack. The power to help our missile an Al-Qaeda convoy and destroyed one of the vehicles in there. And at that point, it crossed the line from an unmanned aerial vehicle into an unmanned combat aerial vehicle. Today, the new Predator B can carry up to 10 Hellfire missiles. Of course, its primary mission is still what the military refers to as ISR, or Information, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. It's basically a poor man's satellite. I mean, you can bring it in and, and, and let it dwell in an area. UAVs transmit important visual information to battlefield commanders via satellite or other data links. Once targets had been located, identified, and cataloged, these could be disseminated to other weapons or weapon systems. Reconnaissance UAVs have multiple ways of conducting surveillance. On clear days, they use specially stabilized optical lenses that can zoom to high magnification. At night, they use infrared, and under adverse conditions, they use synthetic aperture radar to pierce the thickest clouds, sandstorms, or oil field smoke. When the radar is reflected back, it can also be used to create a 3D image of objects. If the enemy chooses to use countermeasures or decoys or deception techniques, Having to beat three systems is a lot harder than one. The success of the Predator paved the way for the development of an even more advanced high-altitude jet-powered UAV by Northrop Grumman. It's called the Global Hawk, but unlike the Predator, it was designed to take off, fly its pre-programmed mission, and land all on its own, thanks to the GPS, or Global Positioning Satellite System. The Global Hawk is basically a much larger version of the Predator. It has higher altitude capabilities, increased payload. It can carry a lot more sensors, a lot more communication devices, and it can loiter over a battlefield for up to 35 hours. The Global Hawk can stay aloft for a day or more, providing constant near real-time video surveillance over an area the size of Illinois. Predator and Global Hawk give us an up-close view which is something you can't get from a national asset, which would be a satellite type of thing. Though still in development, the Global Hawk had a dramatic impact during Operation Iraqi Freedom. A single prototype provided information to Allied forces on 55% of all time-sensitive targets, including mobile Scud missile launchers. Like the Air Force, the Navy wanted its own autonomous UAVs. However, designing one to take off and land on an aircraft carrier was a tremendous challenge. But the engineers at Northrop Grumman were up for it. In the summer of 2000, they began working on the X-47 Pegasus. 
The hardest part of the Pegasus program was definitely the flight controls. Uh, getting on and off an aircraft carrier, of course, is one of the toughest design problems for an aircraft. And doing this with a tailless vehicle like Pegasus certainly was the toughest problem we had. That problem was solved by using six innovative surfaces to make the plane climb, descend, and turn. This surface just rotates up. The yellow bond, of course, both up and down. And then there's another inlay on the lower surface as well. The first flight of uh, Pegasus, the demonstration was uh, very, very successful. It lasted approximately 12 minutes. There was no human in the loop. But could Pegasus, without any human assistance, land within the tiny space between the arresting cables of an aircraft carrier? The engineers came up with an ingenious way to find out. And we actually glued a small paintball down under the bottom of the hook so we could get a clear touchdown point. That was quite an achievement that we're very proud of. The Navy will use its stealthy UAVs to get targeting information for its guns, missiles, and fighter aircraft. The initial focus has been on information surveillance and reconnaissance to provide targeting information to the Navy's strike packages. But many future UAVs, such as Boeing's X-45 unmanned bomber, will be heavily armed. Although flying pre-programmed missions, armed UAVs will still need human permission to fire. It has to know where friendly forces are on the ground, where civilians might be, where collateral damage, i.e. hitting a church or a mosque, might be an issue. So there is a element that we always retain where a human in the loop is important. You can have a weapon that's doing its own surveillance and has its own ability to engage a target, and that gives you a level of dominance that uh, we're just emerging on right now. In the not-so-distant future, there will be even more radical aircraft and airborne weapons systems. Everything from electromagnetic pulse weapons to powerful airborne lasers to hypersonic aircraft that can fly to anywhere in the world in two hours or less. But how soon will these high-tech secrets become a reality? Enigmatic F-117 stealth jet flew in secret for 10 years before its existence was revealed to the public. Some of the unclassified projects that are acknowledged by the Pentagon seem more like science fiction than reality. The military is designing a weapon system designed to neutralize an enemy encampment or factory without destroying it and scattering nuclear, biological, or chemical materials. Electromagnetic pulse, or EMP weapons, will blast a highly concentrated magnetic field towards its target, overloading and destroying any electrical components. The small electromagnetic pulse weapons offer some pretty startling capabilities. You can essentially completely destroy an enemy's electronic infrastructure in a very precise way. You can fly over a small facility, only a couple of acres, fire it, and suddenly none of their computers work, none of their weapons work, none of their electronics at all will work. Researchers are also experimenting with an airborne chemical laser. An entire aircraft has been turned into a chemical energy plant that points that laser at a target and burns through missiles. This aircraft will fly at higher altitudes and will primarily be used for scuds or for ballistic targets that would be fired from one country to another. American generals don't want a fair fight. They want their equipment to be the absolute best in the world so that whatever they come up against, they can defeat it quickly and efficiently. The battlefield of the future will continue to be a dangerous place. But military planners believe that the key to maintaining the security of the United States is to develop the weapon systems of tomorrow, today.
They're out there, lurking in the vastness of space. Planets so weird, even science fiction could not foresee them. For the first time ever, scientists are discovering alien worlds beyond our solar system. Places where ice is hot and rain is made of iron. They are uncharted, unearthly, and unpredictable. And somewhere, hidden among these strange new worlds, scientists seek the greatest discoveries of all. Planets like ours, alien Earths. March 6, 2009. This Delta II rocket is going through its final pre-flight check. It is the start of an extraordinarily ambitious mission. The Kepler Space Observatory is hunting for planets like Earth within a region of 100,000 stars. It is the culmination of a journey that began more than a decade ago with one of the most profound scientific discoveries ever made. nineteen ninety five swiss astronomer michel mayor and his team make a routine observation of stars in the constellation pegasus located fifty light years away but the instruments show something strange one star is violently lurching and wobbling what we discovered it's one of these stars have a velocity changing with time. What is powerful enough to disturb a star the size of our sun? Mayor offers a radical answer, a planet. But no one has ever seen a planet around another sun-like star problem in detecting planets around other stars is that as a planet orbits a nearby star, that planet gets lost because of its feeble light in the glare of the very bright star. In spite of the odds, Mayor relies on his data and is convinced the wobbles are caused by the gravitational pull of an orbiting planet. When I read this claim from Michel Mayor, I was very skeptical. There had been many false claims of the first planet ever discovered around another star, and I thought to myself, oh boy, here we go again. So I decided to observe the star on four consecutive nights, and stunningly, the star was shown to wobble exactly as Michel Mayor had said. Michel Mayor and his teammate Didier Quelos announced their discovery. It rocks the scientific community. They had found for the first time reproducible, confirmable evidence of the existence of a planet around a sun-like star. Officially called 51 Pegasi B, the planet is nicknamed Bellerophon, in honor of the Greek hero who tamed the winged horse, Pegasus. It is a planet that breaks all the rules. Bellerophon roasts in the blazing starlight at temperatures of roughly 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. It is nearly 150 times more massive than Earth and is a gas giant like Jupiter. A gas giant is a planet made mostly of hydrogen and helium. Only the outer layers are gas, 
but inside, hydrogen and helium is compressed to huge, huge, huge pressures. It doesn't resemble a gas at all. Unlike anything found in our solar system, this is an entirely new class of planet, what scientists call a hot Jupiter. If you go to Hawaii and see the lava flow there, that's how hot a hot Jupiter is. It's very, very hot. The Earth is a comfortable 93 million miles away from the sun. These hot Jupiters are roughly 100 times closer, and so the amount of sunlight that they get is 10,000 times larger. If this represents a star, and this a hot Jupiter, a hot Jupiter is three to four stellar diameters away from the star. So that would be one, two, three. This is how close a hot Jupiter would be to its star. Hot Jupiters are tidally locked. They present the same face to the star at all times, just like the moon does to Earth. It's going to be permanent daylight on one side and permanent nighttime on the back. If I were stuck on a hot Jupiter, I'd want to be on the back side and hope that some of the heat from the front side facing the star would make its way around the back. The variations in temperature make Bellerophon's atmosphere extremely windy. The wind howls at thousands of miles per hour, far beyond anything we could ever withstand. The heat blast guarantees water vapor cannot exist. But that doesn't mean there is no rain. It's far too hot for water liquid clouds to form here. But instead, these clouds would be made out of iron. Iron vapor can exist at temperatures much higher than water. And because of that, things could get a little messy. You better have an umbrella that's pretty sturdy, because the iron is going to start coating your umbrella very rapidly and making it extremely heavy and just crush that umbrella. The sky overhead is filled with dancing curtains of color. Charged particles from the nearby star make auroras far more extreme than the northern lights on Earth. There is something even more unique about this newly discovered world. Bellerophon orbits its sun in a blistering 4.2 days. No self-respecting planet goes around a star in 4.2 days. None of the planets in our solar system take such a short amount of time. For scientists, the tiny orbit challenges long-held notions of how planets form. The fact that the planet was orbiting every four days was a total puzzle until one night in the middle of the night I woke up and said, well, this must be proof that planets migrate inwards. They don't stay put where they are. The key to the puzzle is found in how planets are made. Planets are a byproduct of star formation. When stars form, they have a disk of dust and debris around them, and out of that debris, planets form. Much of what we know comes from Hubble Space Telescope, as it aims at regions like the Eagle Nebula. This interstellar cloud is studded with collapsing disks of dust and gas. A giant clump grows in the center of each disk. Temperatures reach a searing 18 million degrees. The same nuclear fusion that powers our sun is unleashed. The star is born. Radiation from the star generates a stellar wind that sweeps away leftover dust and debris. Some of the dust survives and remains in orbit around the newborn star. Over millions of years, 
the dust sticks together, forming knots that grow into asteroids. And the asteroids grow into planets. These planets migrate through the disk until they find a stable orbit. This is why Bellerophon is so close to its parent star. But one newly discovered world has found its stable orbit in a place no planet should ever go. 2001. Hubble Space Telescope is directed to an obscure star some 150 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Pegasus. This is the same region where Bellerophon was found six years earlier. Hubble is tracking another hot Jupiter, discovered by astronomer Jeff Marcy. But this one is different from Bellerophon. You've probably heard of the planet HD 209458b. It's a terrible name. A terrible name for a terrible place. HD 209458b has been dubbed by some as Osiris, after the Egyptian god of the dead. Osiris is over 200 times more massive than Earth. It has migrated perilously close to its sun at a mere four million miles from the blazing solar surface. Osiris broils in a planetary hell. The average daily temperature on Osiris is over 2,000 degrees. Forget global warming. This is global frying, and it causes Osiris to lose an estimated 550,000 tons of air every second. There's a leak of gas, a steady stream of hydrogen and helium, and that's making a big, huge cloud all around the planet. Its atmosphere is bleeding into space. Scientists speculate that a colossal trail of gas spirals behind the planet for thousands of miles. OSIRIS presents an unprecedented opportunity for astronomers. Using Hubble, they analyze the alien planet's bloated atmosphere. This is the absolutely first time where we could tell what is the composition of the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet. Surprisingly, Hubble detects many of the basic chemicals needed for life. Sodium, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But Osiris is far too hot for life as we know it. There may be other forms of life, however, that thrive on higher temperatures. But there's no solid surface as we know it on a hot Jupiter. So this life would have to be just tiny little microbes floating around on aerosols. And on our own Earth, we have life that floats around in our atmosphere. But that life didn't start there. So life almost certainly would not exist on hot Jupiters. Astronomers have discovered many hot Jupiters since Bellerophon was found in 1995. But conditions on these worlds rule them out as places where the drama of life can unfold. One of these gas giants is a planet that teases the rules of evolution. Astronomer Jeff Marcy discovers something shocking about a planet orbiting a star called 16 Cygnus b, located some 70 light years away in the constellation of Cygnus, the Swan. The planet was clearly in an elongated orbit, bringing the planet close to and then far from the host star. And this, of course, defied our expectations based on our own solar system, 
where all of the planets go around our sun in nearly circular orbits like phonograph grooves in a record. Like a giant yo-yo in space, the gas giant swings back and forth across its solar system. That is like the Earth swooping 25 million miles closer to the sun, then slinging past Mars all the way out towards Jupiter every year. And like all of the gas giants in our solar system, this yo-yo planet might have an entourage of moons. Marcy speculates that one of these moons could be similar to Earth. And here's where the interesting story begins. Imagine a rocky moon with lakes, oceans, maybe streams and waterfalls on the surface. The moon orbiting its planet, the two of them orbiting the host star. Unlike the airless moon that circles the Earth, this moon is a world with extreme seasons. On Earth, the seasons are caused by the tilt of our planet. Here, they are caused by the elongated orbit. These poor planets that are in these elongated elliptical orbits suffer terrible changes in their climate throughout a year. As they make their closest approach, the yo-yo planet and its moon are blowtorched by the star. Summer begins. The atmosphere on the Earth-like moon is savaged with raging storms. Category 5 hurricanes on Earth are tiny eddies compared to the monster vortexes that form here. The clouds thicken as the water evaporates. Temperatures rise dramatically. Any water or gases would heat up, and indeed the oceans would boil into steam. So you'd end up with a big steam bath. During the peak of the summer, the entire moon is smothered in 800 degree temperatures. This is the closest approach to the star. During its 26-month orbit, the summer season is barely two months long. But what a season. The planet and its moon swing away from the furnace of the star. Temperatures fall to ranges we would find temperate and comfortable. With the coming of fall, the rains return to the parched and roasted moon. Dry ocean basins are replenished, and the seas rise to form new shorelines. Tranquility prevails as the yo-yo planet and its moon slip into the deep freeze of winter. Now, over 200 million miles from the star, the daytime sky is dark. Temperatures hover around 260 degrees below. Winters are long, lasting 17 months. With the coming of spring, the sun looms large in the skies over this hapless moon as the ice cracks and melts violently. Huge icebergs calve into a stormy and fast-rising ocean. For two preciously short periods, during the spring thaw and the autumn rains, the climate on this Earth-like moon is balmy and comfortable. At a distance of 93 million miles from the star, roughly the same distance as Earth from the Sun. The elliptical orbit of this planet and its moon crosses an area around the star some scientists call 
the Goldilocks Zone. The conditions here are just right for life. If you're too close to the star, then it's too hot. If you're too far away, then it's going to be too cold and everything's going to be icy. But then if you're right in the middle, it's just right. Every star has a Goldilocks zone. Where that zone is depends on the size and temperature of the star. In our solar system, Venus marks the inner boundary and Mars the outer boundary. Earth and its abundance of life is right in the middle. The yo-yo planet passes through the Goldilocks zone twice a year. For three and a half months during the spring as it races inbound. And again in the fall for three and a half months as it hurtles back into the colder reaches of space. Could life survive the conditions outside the Goldilocks zone? There could be life forms that are smart enough to hibernate, as do animals on the Earth during the winter season. If this sounds fantastic, I offer you the tidal zones on the Earth. On the tidal zones, life proliferates, of course, near the seashore, and they do so despite tides. The water coming in, covering many of the life forms, the water going out at low tide, and yet those species survive perfectly well. The strange cycle of the yo-yo planet's orbit creates fleeting conditions suitable for life, but also for death. Some alien planets are even more bizarre. Imagine a world that has no star to orbit. Scientists speculate that our galaxy is teeming with rogue planets, adrift in the murky lanes of interstellar space. These are orphaned worlds, planets that are booted from their solar systems by the chaos of planetary migration. Astronomers call such worlds planemos. Planemos are planets without a star. They're just drifting through the galaxy indefinitely. What massive force would it take to kick a planet out of the solar system? When a young star forms with a contingent of planets around it, many of those planets gravitationally interact with each other. They yank on each other, slingshot each other, so that one of them is ejected from the planetary system, voted off the island, if you will. If you were, unfortunately, a resident on a planet that was kicked out by a collision or a near collision with another large object, you'd probably rapidly move out of the habitable zone. There are hundreds of billions of these lost, wayward, poor, wandering planets out in our Milky Way galaxy with no parent star to warm them up. Cold. Dark, quiet. Because planemos have no sun, they are worlds without days or years. They keep vigil through an eternal night. Planemos are solitary wanderers, sentinels of the galaxy. Just because it's out there drifting in space, doesn't mean a planemo is dead. If the planemo is a rocky world, it could well have life on it. A small rocky planemo without an atmosphere will slumber in extreme cold. Far colder than the coldest winter day on our own South Pole. But a planemo large enough to retain an atmosphere traps the heat generated when the planet was first formed. It is the ultimate greenhouse effect. The heat and energy comes from the molten core deep inside the lonely planet. If the planemo is a gas giant like Jupiter, it may have a system of moons. The gravitational pull between the planemo and its moons creates friction 
causing the interior of the moons to stay warm. And these moons could also have life on them, in the same way that Jupiter's moon Io has volcanoes and has a lot of heat energy being generated by interactions with Jupiter and the other moons. If anything lives here, it will be single cells, like common bacteria found on Earth. Not complex life forms. Without a sun to provide photosynthesis, these tiny organisms derive their energy from the chemistry in the soil of the planemo, or its moon. On Earth, there are similar conditions. Colonies of bacteria are found deep within mine shafts in South Africa. They have no access to oxygen nor light and survive entirely on the chemicals they make from the surrounding dirt. Their metabolisms are extremely slow and they reproduce only once every thousand years. If life dwells on a sunless planemo, it could be organisms like them, marooned when their planet was young. While planemos slumber undisturbed, there are worse places to be in the universe. Like in the company of this lethal pulsar, some 980 light years from Earth, in the constellation of Virgo. From afar, a pulsar looks like a blinking light. But up close, pulsars machine gun their surroundings with deadly radiation. They are no place for planets. Yet something interferes with the precision of this pulsar. One explanation is that the anomaly is caused by a planet. But many astronomers are skeptical that planets orbiting a pulsar can exist. The reason that's a problem is because pulsars are formed in these incredible explosions. When a red giant star explodes, a titanic fireball known as a supernova unleashes as much energy in one minute as our sun generates in its lifetime. When a star goes supernova, the shockwave is so immense it's hard to imagine any planet surviving that. When the cosmic dust clears, all that remains is the crushed core of the red giant pulsing in the heart of an expanding debris field. Matter blasted from the colossal explosion falls back to the pulsar and forms a disk. Within this chaos, a new world arises, born of fire and destruction, a planetary zombie raised from the carcass of the former red giant star. It's amazing that planets could form in that environment. A planet orbiting a pulsar will give you the feeling of being in a disco bar with a very strong strobe light, which is the pulsar. Radiation from this stellar beast breaks down the organic molecules needed for life. The pulsar has these very strong magnetic fields that are being spun around as the star is rotating quickly and it's picking up any material, electrons, protons, and speeding them up and slinging them out at, at high speed. So it's like a, a solar wind with a vengeance. I can't imagine that there would be much of an opportunity for even simple life, microbial life, to emerge and to flourish on a planet around a pulsar largely because if you were in the pulse, you'd be severely energized, and if you were not in the pulse, you would be completely devoid of energy. The discovery of pulsar planets shows how new worlds can form in the wake of a star's destruction. No matter where a planet arises, the process of its birth is fraught with danger. Sometimes, the violence is so great the end of the world comes before the beginning. 2007. 
Astronomers using the giant Gemini North telescope make a strange discovery in the Pleiades cluster some 400 light years from Earth. A star known only by its catalog number, HD 23514, is surrounded by a giant donut-shaped cloud of dust and gas. The star in the middle of the donut shape is about 100 million years old. A cosmic toddler in astronomical terms. Our sun is 45 times older. The conditions are perfect for planets to form. But spectral analysis finds something strange. The dust is utterly pulverized. Typically, a newborn star is surrounded by fledgling planets. Planets form around the young star in a protoplanetary disk of gas and dust. And then these planets go on their merry way orbiting the star not realizing that they're in an orbit that's too close to another planet. Millions of years ago, two primordial planets orbiting HD 23514 are spinning toward doom. As the two worlds close in, tidal forces torque each planet from spheres to egg shapes. Nothing remains. The two worlds are annihilated, creating the dust and debris seen around star HD 23514. Four billion years ago, a similar apocalypse came to Earth. A Mars-sized planet forms in roughly the same orbit as the newborn Earth. Like the planets at HD 23514, Earth and this Mars-sized body are barreling toward each other. If you happen to be unlucky enough to be standing on a growing planet when it was in the process of still becoming the Earth, uh, you might wake up one morning and notice that the sky was getting darker and darker as a Mars-sized body was coming at you within a period of, of less than an hour. And when it hits, the shock wave is felt all over the planet, scouring the surface of the Earth. The collision obliterates one side of the planet. Molten rock sprays out into space. The entire globe is peppered by meteors and noxious vapor. It would actually make hell look like a Bahamas vacation. The debris field from the collision coalesces and forms our moon. It is a new beginning for our planet. Collisions are part of the birth process for planetary systems. Building up a terrestrial planet is probably all about colliding pieces of rock together. And all across the galaxy, colliding pieces of rock are forming terrestrial worlds that defy the imagination. There is a new planet out there, a planet we were not aware of existing before. It is not just one planet. It is a new type of planet, Earth on steroids. I like to call them super-Earths. They are just like the Earth, except bigger, up to about 10 times the mass of the Earth. One family that the super-Earths resemble, just like our own Earth, continents, oceans. Some of them may be very dry, like Mars. And then another family that we call water worlds or ocean planets that are completely covered with water. Welcome to Gliese 581c.
This planet was found by Michel Mayor, and it orbits with two other planets around a very small star. It's only 20 light years away in the constellation of Libra and is one of the smallest terrestrial planets found beyond our solar system. That doesn't mean Gliese 581c is small. It's still a super-Earth with five times the mass of our home planet. But it's the possibility of liquid water that excites scientists. An ocean planet feels like being in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. With no land in sight, just water, puffy white clouds and blue sky above you. The winds on the ocean world are going to be similar to that of the Earth. So it will be a very good place to sail. The weather is absolutely perfect. Every day you get a clear blue sky and the sun just stays in the same place. Now how's that for weather prediction? No land anywhere. Even miles beneath the surface. This water layer would extend very far down, at least a quarter of the way down in the planet. But as we dive deeper into the sea, the pressure builds. At 35,000 feet below the surface, we pass the point where the deepest oceans on Earth bottom out. We pass the 100,000 foot mark. The pressure is so great, water itself begins to take on surprising new forms. At a depth of 10 times the greatest ocean depth on Earth, we reach the bottom. When you have a large amount of water, then at the bottom of an ocean, you will form very high pressure in excess of a million atmospheres and that pressure will compress the liquid water, that is the ocean, into a state which we call ice seven. No, it's not like ice in your refrigerator. The molecules of water that are in the ice in your refrigerator are kind of all jumbled up. But if you form ice under very high pressure, then the water molecules can become ordered, they can become aligned. I can show you a crystal that is a very good analog to I-7. This is halite, also known commonly as uh, rock salt. I-7 may exist within our own solar system. Europa, a moon of Jupiter, could possibly have a mantle of liquid water surrounded by a thick, icy crust. The pressure from the crust is so great that Ice 7 might exist deep within these uncharted seas. If we scale up and thaw out Europa, it could be a water world similar to Gliese 581c. One could imagine that life could emerge on a water world. After all, water is essential to life on Earth. Everywhere on Earth where there is water, there is life. You cannot find a sterile drop of water on Earth unless you put it in the microwave yourself. On this water world, there could be bacteria or any kind of life in the ocean itself. But not all of the super-Earths are water worlds teeming with life. When we talk about super-Earths, we talked about two major families of mostly rocky with some water and uh, mostly water with an endless ocean. But one has to add to those a third family of probably very rare super-Earths and Earth-like planets, which uh, are called carbon planets. A carbon planet is unlike anything we've ever seen anywhere. A place with an alien chemistry, but loaded with very earthly treasures. 
Throughout our galaxy, there are planets barren and poor and inhospitable. But science is on the trail of a new type of planet, an entire world of treasure. In our own solar system, in our sun and in all the stars nearby, there's always more oxygen than carbon. But if we think of a place in the universe where there's more carbon than oxygen, then planet formation is very different. Spectral analysis shows carbon to be far more plentiful 26,000 light years away near the center of our galaxy. Planets that form here may contain a rich abundance of carbon. The morning sky on a carbon world would be anything but crystal clear and blue. I'm picturing a yellow haze with black clouds of soot. And as you descended farther down in the atmosphere, I could imagine lakes that were made out of compounds like methane or gasoline. I'm picturing these bubbling, foul-smelling pits of black ooze, like an oil well. With little or no water in the atmosphere, the air is made of carbon compounds. Methane, butane, pentane, benzene, all these different kinds of carbon compounds that separate out when you refine gasoline. One day it might be raining benzene. The next day it might be raining butane. Alien as carbon planets might seem, the air quality could be familiar to some. The air in a very benzene-rich planet will resemble that of LA. A lot of small particles that unfortunately we are quite used to from the exhaust of cars. Despite the pollution, carbon planets could come with a sparkling upside. You might see diamond because the planet may have substantial quantities of pure carbon that it's formed out of then pure carbon, when you compress it, tends to form into diamond. The secrets of exotic planets like these are waiting to be discovered all across the galaxy. But astronomers won't be satisfied until they find the Holy Grail. A planet like our own, one that sustains life, the next Earth. People always ask me, do I think we're going to find another planet like Earth? And I answer, absolutely. Every star probably has planets roughly the same size as our Earth. We think that essentially every star has several Earth mass or super Earth mass planets. So if you have, say, 200 billion stars in the galaxy, that may mean there are 400 billion Earths in the galaxy or more. 400 billion. The Kepler Space Observatory is the first instrument capable of finding one of these planets. Kepler is looking at the constellation Cygnus in the night sky at 100,000 stars, taking picture after picture after picture, minute after minute. And the goal of Kepler is simple, to look for stars among the 100,000 that dim. When a star dims slightly, it means a planet passes in front, blocking some of the light. How long the star dims and how much light gets blocked will tell scientists about the size of the planet and the distance from its sun. A good analogy for this is looking for the dip in the light that you would see from a searchlight if a small moth flew across the searchlight. And so it's a really tiny dip in the light as the planet transits. It is a very powerful technique because it allows you uh, to uh, discover planets that are even smaller than the size of the Earth around stars similar to the Sun. It is a technique that is changing the course of science. We think we may be able to find a planet that is habitable in the next few years. Scientists estimate the Kepler mission will find a minimum of 50 alien Earths. 
One of the big questions that anybody looking for life beyond the earth is facing today is what if we don't recognize life even though we discover it? Conditions on an alien earth may cause life to evolve differently. My hope is that we'll see some sign that will make our hairs stand up on the back of our necks. Whatever that sign is, it will be the first chapter on the greatest scientific story ever told. Battlefields of the future will be more dangerous than ever. In the 21st century, there will be threats to our freedom and security like never before. But will we be ready? Battles will be fought on land and sea, but they will not be won without supremacy in the air. Enter the incredible world of 21st century combat. Air power is the dominant strategic force. It's air power that lets you influence events and respond to events quickly. It's air power that lets you fight a war without putting hundreds of thousands of people on the ground. To date, Air Force F-15s have won more than 150 dogfights against enemy fighters without a single loss. And the Navy F-18 Hornet is widely recognized as the world's best carrier-based fighter bomber. But in the future, neither the F-15 nor the F-18 will be able to survive against deadly enemy anti-aircraft missiles. Surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, are going to represent the biggest threat. Those very formidable systems developed in Russia or China will have to be taken out of action very quickly in any future conflict. The fighter of the future will need to be stealthy to slip past enemy radar. It must be able to take out anti-aircraft installations. And it must out-dogfight any enemy fighters that get in the way. That future fighter is already here. The F-22 Raptor, the air dominance fighter of the 21st century. Half times the speed of sound, over 1,000 miles per hour. This is all about our pilots being able to go fast, minimize the amount of time they are exposed to any threat, do the mission that we've sent them to do, turn around and come home safely. The F-22 is presently the only fighter in the world with supercruise, but it wouldn't be possible without a very unique set of engines. The goals for Pratt & Whitney were to provide a transformational engine that the Air Force needed, one that was stealthy, maintainable, and fast. The F-119 PW-100 was developed by Pratt & Whitney after years of research. It sets the new standard for jet engines. Along with its incredible supersonic ability, the F-119 incorporates thrust vectoring. Here we are at the rear end of an F-A-22 Raptor. First thing you'll notice are the nozzles for the F-119 engines. In flight, 
during a maneuvering dogfight, they actually move up and down and vector the thrust of the engine to provide maneuverability. It helps us turn inside any foe, uh, maneuver at low or high speeds to outmaneuver another airplane or potentially an enemy weapon that's headed towards us. The F-22's stealth, supercruise, and vector thrusting are impressive breakthroughs, but its most outstanding feature may be its ability to nearly fly itself through advanced computerized controls. It relieves the pilot of all the duties, gives the pilot total freedom to just look out engaged in the combat scenario. In addition to monitoring its own performance, the F-22 constantly gathers data on other aircraft in the combat area and presents the most important information to the pilot. We're going to have information passed to us from either unmanned vehicles or from offboard sensors so that we can integrate data and use that information for targeting. And it's the way that we are driving our forces in warfare. We are much more integrated with both other services and with other platforms, and the F-22 fits right into that concept. The F-22 Raptor's total package of avionics, stealth, supercruise, and thrust vectoring make it the most technologically advanced fighter today. I've never been in an airplane that accelerates as fast, that's as agile, the ability to turn very sharply, and uh, it just brings a great combination of the, the speed, the stealth, and the avionics to the fight that nobody else is going to be able to touch. But there will be future competitors, like the... Developed by Lockheed Martin, this advanced tactical fighter has been designed to be the first plane to cross enemy lines, clearing the way for all other forces. The F-22 is both an air-to-air -air fighter and an air-to-surface fighter, so it can drop precision weapons. That means it'll be able to go in early in a conflict, knock out all the air defenses that an enemy has, and also take out certain ground targets, and open the door for all the U.S. forces, whether they're ground vehicles or other aircraft, to come in and continue the fight. The development of the F-22 Raptor first began in 1985, when the Air Force requested proposals for an advanced tactical fighter jet to replace the F-15 air superiority fighter. Military planners feared that the F-15 would not be able to counter new air and ground threats on the horizon. The result was the creation of the F-22. The capability of the aircraft is a quantum leap above what exists right now, and it's going to take air power and revolutionize it into a, a whole new world. In the battles of the future, stealth will be critical for all new fighters to avoid being seen by enemy radar. Non-stealthy aircraft just will not survive in the uh, air battles of tomorrow. Stealth technology was created to counter advances in radar. Radar works by sending out radio waves and measuring the amount reflected back to determine the distance, speed, and course of an object. But stealth aircraft are designed with surfaces that deflect radio waves away, making them nearly invisible to radar. The world's first stealth production aircraft was the F-117 Nighthawk. The reason that airplane is faceted is a limitation of the computer technology at the time. It's easier to model a finite number of flat surfaces than it is a bunch of curved surfaces. And while the aircraft was a breakthrough at the time, the facets limited the plane aerodynamically. But now, thanks to more powerful computers, engineers can design aircraft that do not have to sacrifice aerodynamics for stealth. The FNA-22's aerodynamic slickness allows it to uh, have the lowest drag of almost any aircraft ever produced. The F-22's aerodynamic superiority, combined with its stealth and firepower, make it a far better adversary than Russian Sukhoi-37, which features thrust vectoring and a radical forward swept wing design. And the fifth generation MiG, the 1.22, which some have nicknamed the F-22 ski.
The Russians are still very active aircraft developers. They've got a variety of technologies that they're continuing to improve upon and that can be made available to our future enemies. And so that's why we have to stay on top of the technology that we are developing and make sure that it is able to take out anything that other countries develop. When you look at the adoption by China of the Su-27 and the fact that it'll probably be modernized and improved, uh, that brings up the need for more advanced fighter aircraft in the U.S. And that's one of the main reasons, I think, why the Air Force is so insistent on the need to have the F-22. In addition to Russia, other U.S. allies are producing advanced interceptors for export that are superior to the F-15, such as Sweden's JAS-39 Gripen and France's new Raphael. Germany, Italy, and the UK have joined forces to create a Eurofighter, the Typhoon. If these planes fall into unfriendly hands, the US Air Force will need the F-22 to maintain their advantage. We are always gonna go into war wanting to have that air dominance, and the F-22 is going to be the big boy on the block that can help us to do that. In future combat, the F-22 is to be joined by another stealthy aircraft, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the ground attack bomber of the future. Designed for the U.S. Air Force, Navy, Marines, and Britain's Royal Navy, the question is, will it work for every user? The rules of war have changed. Brute force has given way to high tech, and conventional weapons of the past will no longer be effective. In future battles, the F-22 will be the first fighter to cross enemy lines, surgically removing air and ground targets. Next in, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the attack bomber of the future. It will assume the air-to-ground attack role for the U.S. military. The F-35 can carry heavy weapons externally for maximum effect. But when a smaller payload is carried internally, it is nearly as stealthy as the vaunted F-117 Nighthawk. It has a significant amount of stealth capability to allow it to be used. Any aircraft before it. The F-15, which the F-22 will replace, has been a very successful fighter, but it is not stealthy. The F-117, while stealthy, carries no air-to-air -air weapons and is not designed for air combat. It relies on stealth and mission planning to protect itself. But the F-22, on the other hand, is not only stealthy, but comes with a full complement of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons. The primary ar armament is in weapons bays underneath the airplane where we carry six medium-range radar-guided missiles. By carrying the weapons internally, it preserves the stealthy shape of the plane. For closer infighting, the F-22 has short-range missiles and guns. Behind these two doors right here is the side weapons bay. This is where we carry heat-seeking missile. For close-in armament, the Raptor is equipped with the M61A2 cannon. The muzzle is hidden right behind this door right here. It's hidden because of the uh, stealth characteristics of the airplane. Cannon carries 480 rounds and is capable of shooting 100 rounds a second. The F-22's advanced weapons systems will make it a formidable interceptor, as will its unique ability to find enemy aircraft without revealing its own position. When other planes use their radar, they become visible to every other radar system in the area. But that's not the case with the F-22. Perhaps the highest tech part of the airplane is the radome itself. Not only does the radome have to be stealthy, but it has to be able to transmit and receive its own radar signals. How the F-22 radar achieves that remarkable feat is classified. But what is known is that the F-22 can see enemy aircraft at a distance while remaining invisible to them. The first time that the bad guys will really notice an F-22 in the area is when one of them blows up. A 
along with its advanced radar system, F-22 is the first fighter to have super cruise, the ability to travel faster than the speed of sound without using its afterburners. A jet's afterburners boost speed by pouring fuel directly into the hot blast of the engines, adding fiery extra thrust. But afterburners are also wasteful, consuming enormous amounts of fuel, dramatically affecting the range and duration of a plane's mission. But the F-22 doesn't have that problem. Without using afterburners, it can supercruise at an incredible one and a half